Hello, I'm Jimmy Lin. I'm a veteran of 30 years in the global sports and entertainment sectors, currently serving as a co-founder and vice president of Kizwe Mobile, which is focused on pioneering and empowering the next generation of digital fan experiences. I also serve as an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business and also with a sports in industry management program in the School of Continuing Studies. I want to take a moment to thank CHCI for putting together this briefing to honor the Latino community's lasting contributions to American sports, arts, and culture. As we have seen, the current pandemic amplified the deeply rooted in inequities that have impacted Latinos across all sectors in our society. Now more than ever, Latino rep representation matters. And that is why for over four decades, CHCI has educated, empowered, and connected Latino leaders so they can forge a brighter future for themselves, their families, and our country. As CHCI continues its leadership development programs to ensure Latino leaders in all areas, including sports and the arts, are both empowered and connected with the most influential Latinos in our nation, please consider supporting them by going to chci.org backslash donate and chipping in. chci.org backslash donate. Our, our community must have a seat at the table to ensure we provide greater opportunities in the future and they can't do it without your help. We will start today's program with a panel discussion highlighting the remarkable accomplishments of Latino pioneers in sports and culture and end with a curated exhibit highlighting Latinos contributions through sports artifacts and stories. Now let's get to the discussion and introduce our panel. In the interest of time, I'm only gonna do the briefest of intros for our speakers as I welcome them. I encourage you to look up these incredible leaders online to learn more about them. Let me introduce all four speakers, and then we'll invite each of them to give some opening remarks. To start us off, I'm pleased to welcome Congressman Linda Sanchez, who proudly represents California's 38th Congressional District. Nationally recognized as, as a leading progressive voice in Congress for working families, Congresswoman Sanchez serves as vice chair of the House Democratic Caucus, the fifth highest ranking position in House Democratic leadership. She is also the first Latina elected to a leadership position in the U.S. Congress and is a former CHCI chair. Welcome, Congresswoman. Our next guest is Roberto Alomar, an extraordinary athlete who became the first Major League Baseball player to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame as a Toronto Blue Jays player. Currently, Roberto Alomar serves as special advisor to the Toronto Blue Jays. Welcome, Roberto. Now I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Margaret Salazar Porzillo, the curator of Latinx history and culture in the Division of Cultural and Community Life at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. She is currently project director and lead curator of the exhibition of book Play Ball in the Barrios and the Big Leagues, which we'll be showing at the end of this briefing. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Salazar Porzio. And finally, please join me in welcoming Roberto Clemente Jr., who is the son of the late Roberto Clemente and brother of Luis Clemente. Clemente spent three seasons in the minor leagues working as a baseball commentator and eventually established the Roberto Clemente Foundation. Welcome, Roberto Clemente Jr. Now let's begin with the opening remarks and we'll start with Congresswoman Sanchez. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I wanna start by saying go Dodgers. Um, 
but I also want to talk about the fact that sports and the arts are kind of the connective tissue that brings together people from all different backgrounds. You, they're kind of like universal languages because you don't have to speak Spanish to appreciate the work of artist Frida Kahlo. You don't have to visit um, you know, Mexico to appreciate the skills of Mel Almada. Arts and sports have an unspoken impact on anyone, anywhere. And in particular, Latinos have made a large impact on American arts and sports. Um, and I just want to say personally, you know, sports can have a huge impact on all of us. Um, I remember as a kid growing up, I, I came from a family of seven children. Um, my father made sure that all of us played baseball and softball. Um, it was his way of doing family bonding time. And I remember he was always so proud when he bought the cheapest seats that he could for all of us to go to Major League Baseball games uh, to cheer on our hometown team and, you know, to look at where hard work and practice could get you. Um, by the same token, my parents also wanted me to play soccer. So they, you know, enrolled me in soccer. And I'll never forget, I was a very shy and introverted child until I got on a soccer team and um, had this big Italian, like this Italian coach with this big booming voice. And he used to yell, yeah, I need you to pass the ball or, you know, chip it back, you know, to the, to the goalie or whatever. And, and I was, you know, really shy and quiet. And he would look at me and say, nod your head if you understand what I'm saying. And I would look up at him and I would nod. Uh, but the more confident and the more skilled I became in soccer, the more vocal and the more aggressive I was. And it was really for a Latina, you know, girl, uh, kind of a revelation that on a soccer field, you could be aggressive and you could be you know, vocal, and that wasn't something that was always afforded to me in a home where you respected elders and where, you know, as children, you, you knew your place and you, you didn't speak un, un, unless spoken to. And, and on that team, I like to say that I found my voice. And, and once I did, I learned to stand up for myself and be more vocal. And over time, I learned to stand up for my community um, and be a vocal advocate for them. So you know, that sports lesson has helped me over and over again in life. Um, I will say this, you know, when I was in junior high, they had a boys soccer team. They did not have a girls soccer team. So I signed up to play on the boys team. And I brought a few of my um, uh, girlfriends who played soccer with me. And they were completely unprepared uh, for that scenario. And I, I think we caused a bit of a ruckus, but we proved our talent. And by the end of the season, we made the all-star team. So I just want to say that so often as Latinos and Latinas, and especially as Latinas, doors are clo often closed to us for no really good reason. But we have to challenge that status quo ourselves, otherwise nothing changes. And that's why, you know, we see underrepresentation of Latinos across many areas. Um, but we have to invest in the talent that exists in our community. We have to support that talent. Um, even parents, you know, very well-intentioned parents may have some, you know, uh, hesitation about their kids saying, I want to grow up and be an artist, or I want to grow up and be a professional athlete. Yet they need that support in order to get there and make those dreams happen. And as a policymaker, you know, we have to, I have to do a better job in you know, supporting initiatives that are going to help kids live up to their true potential and dreams, no matter what those dreams and goals are. And I really believe that athletic and artistic success for our Latino children is going to lead to more opportunities across the board in every um, in every kind of career imaginable. So I'm I'm really grateful that you're holding this important discussion today, so we can continue to support budding Latinos who have talent in sports, art, and, and, and culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Sanchez. That, that was awesome. Now let's go to Major League Baseball, the great Roberto Alomar. Hi, how are you guys doing? I'm, uh, first of all, I'm not gonna follow Linda's uh, speech. It was wonderful. Linda, thank you for uh, saying those kind of, kind of words. Uh, about myself, I grew up in the, in the baseball family. Uh, I am from a small town, Salinas, Puerto Rico. 
And first of all, I'm really proud to be a Latino. I think being a Latino, uh, uh, there was a lot of um, ups and downs, especially in the minor leagues. Uh, I, I grew up up in the Bay family. It's always good to, to have a, a, uh, some good parents. I think uh, what helped me to become who I am today, it was always the advice and the love that my mom and my dad and my family always gave me. Uh, I think um, the values that they gave me not only as a player, but as a person helped me to become who I am today. And, and what I wanted to tell all the Latino youth is that life like my father used to say, life is, is like walking in the tunnel. And you walk in that tunnel, and in, in the end of that tunnel, there's going to be something good waiting for you. But during that tunnel, you have to make sure that you as Latinos, you have to learn how to say no, because there's going to be a lot of temptations beside you. Uh, uh, it's going to be a lot of work. It's not going to be easy. But you have to... believe in who you are and, and always be strong mentally. I think being strong mentally and being a Latino, it is a good thing. You know, I, I took advantage because uh, I, 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 I knew Spanish. I had to learn the language of English to be able to communicate with others. So I have an advantage because I speak two languages and uh, I, I had to look life like I had an advantage at that time, but uh, it was a lot of a lot of tears, a lot of smiles, a lot of work. Uh, but I had a great family behind me, and I think that helped me to become uh, who I am today. And I always tell the young guy, there's always something good for you out there. You just have to believe in yourself, and whatever you choose to do in life, make sure that you love what you do day in and day out. And I think by loving what you do day in day out, you will accomplish. A lot of family and for all Latinos. Thank you, Roberto. Now, no one can turn the double play like Roberto off second base. So smooth. <laughs> uh, now, let's, work. Uh, now let's go next to the uh, wonderful Dr. Margaret Salazar Porzio. Hi, thank you, Jimmy, um, for that generous introduction um, of all of us. From my vantage point as a curator of Latina, Latino, Latinx history and culture at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, we're at an inflection point in our nation. Um, our shared future really requires us to work together to find safe spaces for diverse communities to dialogue. Um, we really try to emphasize and focus on our common ground and on empathy. And really, this is what arts, culture, and sports provide. Um, Latinas and Latinos are making huge strides and creating a lot of momentum. And the Smithsonian, especially under the leadership of Secretary Lonnie Bunch, focuses on creating these opportunities for collaborations with communities that enable people, whatever their identities, backgrounds, positions, um, to thrive, to engage meaningfully in the arts and cultures and sports of community life, and to contribute to the flourishing of others because we only succeed together um, through our common interests and our shared histories together, which is what we try to feature. And the Smithsonian Latino Center has been at the forefront of these efforts. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with fellow museum professionals who are dedicated to this kind of public work. And we've really tried to model the full participation of communities in our projects, like the upcoming Play Ball in the Barrios and the Big Leagues in Los Barrios y Las Grandes Ligas exhibit, um, which documents how Latinas and Latinos have changed America's game and how baseball has changed our communities. So you'll hear a little bit more about that when we give you the sneak peek a little later. Um, but we've actively worked with individuals and institutions across the country to develop our collections or exhibitions in our scholarship and to create this kind of dialogue through baseball because baseball just is such a rich entry point. And um, the arts, culture, and sports more generally are these essential pieces of our lives. Fundamentally, they're about how we as human beings make sense of the world around us and they connect us through what we have in common rather than what makes us different, which is exactly what the Congresswoman was saying. Um, so it's my great honor to be able to share with the world these stories of Latinas and Latinos who love, whose love for baseball um, and incredible talents have changed the game and transformed American culture forever. But I'm also super honored to be on this panel with these public leaders who have made incredible impacts in their communities and in the nation more broadly. So it's a pleasure to be here with you all. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Salazar Porzi. I mean, you know, being a Washington DC person and having access to the Smithsonian, such an amazing place, I love it. And I always uh, push my Georgetown students to go and explore and to expand their mind. So thank you very much. Now, what's interesting, it wasn't that long ago, the, the you know, the ethnic makeup of Major League Baseball was about 30% African-American and seven or 8% Latino. And it's completely switched. It's now at 30, 31% Latino. And, you know, Roberto Clemente Jr., when your father was playing, you, you know, he was in that distinct minority of 7%. And, and uh, just amazing. I, I'm sure you, you witnessed this over the, over the decade. So it's uh, great to have you. And Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Jimmy. I, I truly am honored to be part of this panel. Uh, when you talk about, you know, sports, arts, culture, I believe it's all interconnected. As human beings, we need every piece of it. Um, our brains are, are built to handle everything that comes at us to be able to become a whole rounded person. So to be able to experience sports culture um, and, and have the support, a support that, uh, uh, you know, system that can right now change the way our kids are growing up. Uh, we're, we're right now seeing uh, and hearing a lot of things that I remember hearing when I was a very young boy in the 60s and 70s, right? Um, I myself experienced um, racism. I've seen it all. I've been beaten and left for dead uh, several times because of the color of my skin. Uh, little did they know that I was Puerto Rican, but that learned me, that kind of took me to a point to understanding what uh, the people in this country have been going on and going through for a long time. Um, I know that my father left a legacy of, of unity. Uh, he represented the poor people, which has no color, the hardworking people, which has no color. Um, and the people that have suffered injustice. And to be able to have the same conversations that he was having in the 60s and 70s, today, uh, it surprises me. But right now we have the ability of truly taking ownership and how we can actually change from the ground level up uh, to change the culture of this country. Uh, today we have an uh, we have an opportunity uh, to do so. So I'm very grateful of being part of this panel. Thank you, Roberto. Hey. Now we know you played uh, professional baseball for a couple years. Do you have an arm from the outfield, or anything like your father? You know, I am starting. By the way, Jimmy, thank you for the the question. I am starting a uh, a show. Uh, the quest for the player, for the bazooka, that, that guy that could throw the ball, like today from 90 feet uh, off, they're walking, they're jogging to home plate. If you have someone that had the armor my father had that we haven't seen since, it will be a very exciting to see or to try to watch those guys uh, score from 90 feet away when you have 350 on the other side and how fast the ball can get there. I am going to go globally to do a show, ironically, about finding that arm. Oh, that's great. Uh, so uh, I think Cor Corey Seager tried to show off his arm the other night. <laughs> He's got quite an arm. From so uh, we're going to start uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. We're going to ask the panelists questions. We're going to start with... Uh, Congresswoman Sanchez, and we'll go to Roberto after this. So, Congresswoman Sanchez, as we all know, the nation and the world has been dealing with COVID-19 this year. Many sectors of society have been greatly affected. Of course, the health and safety of our communities are paramount, but in terms of sports and the arts, how has your district been impacted? What should our viewers be thinking about in the next few months as we continue to tackle COVID and try to get back to our normal lives and activities? Thank you. Sure. So um, my district, which is majority minority, has been hugely impacted by the pandemic. Everybody knows that communities of color are hit harder by COVID um, infection rates as well as death rates. And then we have the sort of economic impacts that, you know, have really hurt many, many families. You know, as Latino community, we're, you know, we're, we're very kind of tight knit and we, you know, we hug each other when we see each other, 
those kinds of things. And all that has been disrupted by COVID, including sports and other social gatherings, which, you know, which our kids use as a huge outlet. So um, it's a, it's a big creative outlet for kids. And unfortunately, you know, we can't live our lives the way we did pre COVID. And, you know, as much as we want to get back out there, we have to do it in a safe way. Um, what has been just shocking to me is that, you know, the president and the administration has had no national plan or strategy. Um, it has not had a, uh, you know, it has not led on that issue. And as a result, that pa the pandemic has spread like wildfire. Um, and, you know, we're, we're living in an age where just, you know, whether you wear a mask or not is some kind of political statement or whether you believe in science or not is some kind of political statement. Um, and we can't crush COVID um, if we all are not adhering to what the infectious disease, you know, uh, experts tell us. So we have to take precautions, but we can go about doing, engaging in some of these activities. We just have to do them in a very safe um, way. And so, you know, what I think about is, you know, how do we get kids back to school, but in a safe way? Um, how do we get kids participating? And, you know, I believe being outdoors is one of the best ways to, you know, uh, get kids to blow off steam and, 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 and to get, you know, physical exercise. And there are things that you can do short of, you know, playing, you know, matches against each other that still keeps kids, you know, physical, um, you know, conditioning uh, in shape and, uh, and allows them to, you know, run around and, and get rid of some of that energy that they have bottled up doing distance learning all day. I mean, I'm a mom of an 11 year old. I know what it's like to try to do my job and help my son do distance learning and they need to blow off steam. So as we're looking ahead, you know, finding interesting and creative ways to get kids um, you know, to be physical and, and, and to participate in, in physical activities and creative activities as well, um, but to do it in a safe way. And, um, you know, and my hope is that at the federal level, we can get, you know, uh, our counterparts in the Senate to understand the need to invest money in our communities so, so that they, you know, do not continue to feel isolated and um, under attack from COVID. Great. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Sanchez. The next question is for uh, Roberto Alomar. Uh, Roberto, as a former Major League Baseball player, what, in your opinion, is the biggest impact that Latinos ha have had on baseball? Well, the biggest impact is that we, we have had uh, a lot of great players. And uh, we have, uh, I got some numbers here for you guys. We have over 48% of minor, 48% uh, I minor league player are from Latin America. And 26% uh, are playing in the big league right now. And that's a big impact. You know, having the Roberto Clemente uh, award in, in the big leagues, that's a big impact. Uh, Roberto Clemente for us, for me, uh, but for me, uh, it, it is, I, I call him a hero because a hero is what you follow. And by following, uh, I, I had the, uh, the, I've been blessed that I, I have his name, Roberto. I, 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 I always carry his name. And also I wear his number for backwards. I wear number 12 and he wear number 21. So for me, Roberto Clemente is, 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 is a hero for us. He's the, the, the person that we always wanted to be, be like. And we know that we're never going to be like Roberto Clemente. It's not going to be another Roberto Clemente. We, at least we can follow him and uh, try to do the things that he did. And uh, hopefully we can, we can do a good job. Uh, and, and also, you know, MLB has helped me so much here, especially in Puerto Rico. It's a big impact on, on creating programs for kids all the way. So uh, I, I think the problems are there. The opportunities out, are, are out there for, for young guys. Uh, I, we, we just have to continue to have a voice for the young guys to stay in the right path. And uh, there's always going to be opportunity for them out there. So I think the, the Major League ball players who are playing now, that you have a voice to continue to help Latinos to, to become together and have one voice. Because we as Latinos, we have to stick together. And, and by sticking together, I think we can do a lot of great things. 
That's an ama amazing uh, answer, Roberto. Th thank you very much for sharing that. That's powerful. Uh, Dr. Salazar Porzio, a uh, uh, question for you. As the uh, play ball exhibit highlights, before Latinos were permitted to play in the major leagues, we were playing in our local communities in San Lots and the streets. Can you please talk about how you built this collection from the ground up with local communities? Sure, I I'd love to. Um, ultimately, this project has been community driven from the very start. And so it necessarily needs to reflect its community roots in the stories and the objects that we highlight in our exhibits. Um, we worked really closely with a number of communities across the country to document stories and to collect objects that bring the story home. Um, obviously, you'll see Major League stories throughout, um, but they have a community-based aspect to them. And, you know, we know that only a very small portion of Latino players make it to the Major Leagues. Um, and this is actually mostly a recent phenomenon post-World War II, mostly um, in the past three to four decades. Up until that point, many Latinos were never even given a chance in the MLB because of Jim Crow racism and discrimination. So until Jackie Robinson broke the color line in 1947, Latinos weren't really allowed to play in the major leagues. And, um, you know, although there, there were exceptions, of course. Um, and so the tradition of Latinas and Latinos in baseball is fundamentally a community story where players created their own teams and local businesses supported these community leagues. Um, and, and where, you know, people started there, um, where, where these amazing, talented players started, um, because that's where they could play the game. Um, another part of the story is that some recent players um, in Major League Baseball wouldn't necessarily identify as Latino. They might identify as Latin American or with their home countries, um, because they've come to the United States specifically to play in the Major Leagues. And so these are national and international stories, and they're stories with humble beginnings. They're also about labor, they're about immigration, they're about finding home in a new place. Um, so most of the Latino baseball that we're documenting and showing to the world in our exhibit is related to communities, because even though this is a national and international story, history happens locally, and these local stories and trends um, can be like microcosms of national stories and trends. Um, I really believe that communities are where rich national stories can be found, um, whether it's, you know, someone becoming part of a new community, um, how players have organized for better labor conditions on the baseball field um, after a long day of picking citrus or beets in the same fields. Um, really, these are where our stories are grounded. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I, one, I'm excited to see the video in a few minutes, but I also can't wait to to come see the exhibit, so thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Roberto Clemente Jr., this is a great uh, and a very timely question. Your father, Roberto Clemente, was fre frequently outspoken about racial issues in an era where segregation was still occurring. In a time where our country is in a renewed period of social unrest, how important is it for athletes to use their platform to draw attention to injustices? Well, I can tell you, Jimmy, Today, uh, we live in a day that, uh, you know, when my father was playing, he came up in 1955. That was shortly after, you know, Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. Um, as a black Puerto Rican to end up in Montreal and then end up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is a steel city, and no one could understand why this black person spoke a different language, um, was able to now come into a culture uh, of hardworking people, but not of being understood. Uh, there was a lot of issues that happened, not only here in Pittsburgh, but also in the South, uh, where the racism was very evident. That formed a, uh, that helped form uh, my father of who he was and, and why he was vested in fighting injustice. Because he understood uh, that when he came up to the States, they actually saw his color and they put him in with the African Americans in their neighborhood. Well, Little did they know that that was something that he was not, um, he was not used to. This is a, another shock. So now he has two different cultures 
that he has to learn and acclimate to and be able to learn to be able to navigate through life while trying to play a game, a sport that you know how to play, but now the mind, the mind is something that um, you must be very strong to suffer the racism issues, uh, language barriers, all the little things that you don't think about because you understand the language, but he had to go through that from the very beginning, but to be able to come out on the other side as an advocate for, for equality, uh, an advocate for programs and education that will elevate our people to be able to compete at the same level is something that I'm very proud of and something that we must continue to do today. Great, thank you. I, I gotta say to CHC, yeah, you, to get, you had a home run with this panel. What a great uh, group moderator. And by the way, Congressman Sanchez, Congresswoman Sanchez is our MVP because she's multitasking. She's not only talking, she's in the chat room. So if, if you want to have a direct interaction with Congresswoman Sanchez, uh, hit her on check because she, she, she's throwing back some great, great feedback. So uh, Congresswoman Sanchez, uh, uh, to you next, please. Uh, you are one of the few women to play in the congressional baseball game and even wear a jersey with a Roman numeral nine in support of the landmark Title IX position. Um, you know, just personally speaking, I was involved with Obama White House when they did the first celebration for Title IX back in 2010 and with Valerie Jarrett and uh, Arnie Duncan. I remember said it was the first time it had ever been celebrated. And the power in that room was just spectacular, incredible. So uh, uh, amazing. Can, can, uh, how can sports be a vehicle that helps promote uh, gender equality? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so the congressional baseball game, which is a only in Washington kind of event, has Democrats who play Republicans from the House and Senate. Um, and we, you know, throw on uniforms, we lace up our cleats and we play in a National League stadium at Nat Stadium. We, and the proceeds of the ticket sales go to charity. Um, so when I first got to Congress, and I showed up for the first baseball practice. Now I come from a family of seven kids. I had four brothers who played baseball. I had, me and my two sisters played fast pitch softball. So I've played enough baseball to, to know what I'm doing. But when I showed up, uh, you know, there were a lot of looks. Nobody said anything, but the looks was like, doesn't she get that this is hardball, not, not softball? Um, but then when they saw me play, they're like, okay, this girl knows what she's doing. She's not gonna get hurt. Um, but, you know, so often women aren't given the benefit of the doubt. You know, people don't look at them and think, oh yeah, they belong here, right? And I experienced that. Um, that's why I wear Roman numeral nine as my number because it represents landmark legislation that gave women equal opportunity in higher education through sports. It is what allowed women to get scholarships to play sports at college. It has increased the number of women who gotten the opportunity to go to college because of those um, because of their scholarships. So it, it, it's been a great equalizer. Um, but in particular, something that I really fundamentally believe in the depths of my soul are that sports are really good for women in many different respects. I, I talked a little bit about my experience playing soccer and about how I blossomed and became vocal and an advocate and I could stand up for myself and ultimately became an advocate for my community. But something that people don't know is that, you know, when young girls play sports, um, and they've tracked this through studies, um, they're less likely to get into abusive relationships. They're less likely to have unwanted pregnancies. They're less likely to have depression. They're more likely to develop confidence, uh, which then empowers them to be confident in math and science or in art or in whatever field that they choose. Um, and sports teaches all kids, but especially um, young girls, um, important life lessons. Um, it teaches them that you're not always going to win. And so you have to learn to deal with losing and, and how do you pick yourself up from those bad situations and, and move forward having learned something from an experience where you didn't win. Uh, it, it, it helps kids determine, like develop their grittiness, um, their resiliency. Um, and so I think it is a huge you know, equalizer for women, uh, you know, young girls who grow into women. And, and, and finally, you know, when you talk to kids and who've played on any kind of sports team and you say, did you make friends on your team? Um, the answer is overwhelmingly always yes. So if you have co-ed teams where you have 
uh, boys and girls playing together or men and women playing together, um, it forges these friendships that become relationships that, you know, um, down the line can be very productive in terms of, you know, whatever career people choose. So I, I really, really can't say, you know, strongly enough what a great equalizer sports is. And so for women, it is truly a door opener. Thank you, Congresswoman Sanchez. Your, your passion and authenticity just, just comes, comes through the screen. So, and I, I personally have mentored a lot of women athletes at Georgetown and been strong support of the WNBA. And I couldn't agree more. I just see the, the amazing effects that the sports has. So thank you for that. Uh, so Mr. Roberto Alomar, you are one of five Puerto Rican born players to be elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. What does this mean to you and how can we use these success stories to empower Latinos, not just in sports, in, uh, in, but in other aspects of life and society? Well, for me, uh, first of all, being inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, it was one of the biggest moments of my life. Uh, uh, knowing that, uh, that I had the chance and the opportunity to thank the fans uh, from all United States, from all Canada and all over the world, and, and to thank especially my family. My family who are the one who, really my mom who was the one who always took me to the games in Little League when my father was in there. So uh, uh, it was uh, a, a, a proud moment, not only for myself, but a proud moment for my family, for all Latinos and for all the Puerto Ricans. We, we, we have to understand that when, when we're Latinos and, and, and we go to the United States and play the game of baseball, we're playing for not only for, for ourselves, but we're playing for the whole Latino, for the whole world. And, uh, and uh, to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, uh, only, I, I want to let you guys know that only uh, ni over 19,000 players have played the game of baseball. And 233 I made it into the Hall of Fame. That's really a low percentage. And we have 13 Latinos in the Hall of Fame. And I know it's going to be more coming really, really soon. So that shows you how, how strong and how good Latinos are playing the game of sports. And I'm really proud of, 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 of the, all the guys. And, uh, but for me, it was like a dream come true. And uh, I can't thank enough uh, to all the Latinos and my family and my mom, my dad, who, who were there for me since day one. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, next, um, we have a question to Dr. Salazar Porzio. So how are women in particular featured in this baseball exhibit? Thank you so much for asking. Um, well, when I started collecting for the Latinos in Baseball Project, um, which is now the Playball exhibit, I knew that we needed to document women's stories. Um, baseball is almost always thought of as a man's domain, um, but we have worked really hard to find these women's stories. Um, because they've given tirelessly of their time, talent, and treasure in support of the game and their communities. Um, and they've played important roles as players, fans, mothers, daughters, wives. Um, they've made their own teams, but they've also sewn patches on uniforms, cared for children, sold concessions, um, made the food and the uniforms sometimes. Um, and 11 Latinas played in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, um, setting and breaking records. Um, more recently, with Linda Alvarado, uh, women are becoming owners in Major League Baseball, and Playball really acknowledges the significant roles that women have played. We try to emphasize this history in our upcoming exhibit. Um, but I, I want to say a congratulations to someone from the chat, uh, Liliana Perez, who is the inaugural director of cultural affairs for the Los Angeles Chargers in the NFL. Just saw your chat. Um, we have to highlight these amazing Latinas and Latinos because if young people can see others in these positions, they can enter these roles too. Oh, that, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Roberto Clemente Jr., how can nonprofit organizations work with the sports community to continue making progress in racial and social equity? Wow, well, that's a loaded question um, because when we talk about nonprofits, uh, there's not many, much power. Uh, to nonprofits to make a change, unless there's a connection to um, Capitol Hill, obviously, right? Now, I truly believe uh, that we as a people, 
need to start uh, unifying, uh, uniting, because there are so many different nonprofits that are, are the missions are pretty similar, uh, but if you can find collaboration, uh, that's where the power starts building. Um, we are trying, we're kind of scattered in my mind in many ways. If we take a look um, where we need to move forward and where we need to be of impact today, um, sponsoring teams uh, for our, 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 our minority kids that don't have the ability of buying equipment, uh, being able to have a field neighbor, close by their neighborhoods to be able to play sports. How about sponsoring a, a school or group to be able to go to a museum, to be able to learn about art and culture? Um, there are so many things that we're missing, but most importantly, I believe that we're missing the boat when we come, when we, when we, we talk about the, our foundation. Our foundation as human beings starts right up here. Um, being able to um, channel our intellect, our um, elevate our education, making sure that we protect our brains. And, and I myself, I can tell I suffered many brain injuries uh, even before the age of high school. So I have learned that the brain is the most um, fragile organ and the most powerful organ that we own. So being able to protect our brain, understand how we as human beings, our brain are actually functioning is the actual foundation that we must as not only Latinos, but as humans be able to engage and understand how we can elevate ourselves as human beings by protecting what we are, which is our brain. So this is a different monster, if you will, in terms of how we can elevate, but I think that um, having programs from the nonprofits to sponsor uh, clinics and sports, being able to you know, take kids to the, um, like I said, uh, museums, but most importantly, the engaging and interaction and how our brains are working because that, that is how we're gonna be able to better ourselves, understanding who we are, where we are, and where we're going. Great, thank you, thank you so very much. You know, I had a great time moderating this panel two years ago in a hotel room in DC, and it's a little bit different virtually, but this, this has been an amazing hour, both the video and the chat going back and forth. So thank you so much to the panelists. Um, so we're going to ask each panelist to give a one minute or so closing remark, uh, and then we're going to show this fantastic video. So we will start with our leader, Congresswoman Sanchez. Closing remark, please. Yeah, I would just like to say that, you know, I, and it was just asked in the chat box whether there are things that policymakers can do to sort of ensure um, more opportunities. And I, I just want to mention that, you know, I was proud to sign on legislation that would require equal pay and compensation for all Olympic and amateur athletes. I'm sure many of you have followed the trials and travails of the women's US soccer team and how they are, you know, um, they have just as high viewership as the men, but they get paid far less. Um, so things like that can make a difference, but um, as a policymaker, there was always more that we can do more uh, to do to improve diversity in sports. And so I'm going to challenge myself after this panel to think of ways that I can help in that area. But if you all have ideas as well, feel free to contact my office because I would love to hear them and, and love to push for them. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Sanchez, and good luck to your Dodgers. We'll be cheering them on tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next, we'll go to Mr. Roberto Alomar. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for this opportunity. To all you guys in the panel, thank you for all your stories. I would love to meet you one day and hopefully soon. Uh, for me, uh, my last word is uh, let's continue to give more opportunities to the Latin, Latin people. Uh, I know that we all have a voice, and our voice, I want to be heard. And uh, I know that... Uh, Let's, let's give him a lot of love, uh, give him more opportunities, and, and embrace them. I think when we continue to embrace uh, us, the Latinos, 
we we're gonna have more opportunity to do so. And uh, and all I can say is we 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 with our boys. I know we are not gonna change the world, but we can make a difference. Thank you, Roberto Alomar. Thank you so much for participating. It's an honor to be on this panel with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Dr. Margaret uh, salazar Porzio for her remarks, please. Um, thank you so much. This has been uh, a pleasure. Um, we are in a difficult moment as a society, but we're in this together. And I see a bright future ahead of us if we can take the examples of culture, arts, and sports, um, because they're frequently at the forefront of change. Latinas and Latinos in particular play a significant role in the past, present, and future of our nation. And I, I don't want us to forget that here. I'm so pleased that this panel has celebrated these accomplishments, um, but also that we've really talked a, a little bit. We've skimmed the, skimmed the surface of complexity of what it means to be Latina, Latino, Latinx in America. So thank you everyone for, for being part of this. Great, thank you very much. And batting cleanup, our man, Roberto Clemente Jr. If you can, uh, your closing remarks, please. Thank you. Well, Jimmy, thank you and all the panelists. Uh, I truly believe that uh, the conversation has just started. Um, we are very, very far uh, to where we need to be in terms of understanding each other and, and being able to have a seat in the bargaining table uh, when it comes to slicing up the pie. Um, I believe that we as Latinos, we're very passionate um, we have gone through a lot. Uh, I mean, from the Black Lives Matter movement, we are part of that. We are part of what's been going on in terms of that. But then all the streets that we are marching on, the underlay and the undercurrent of those streets are laid out with Latino names that are, have been out there invisible and just vanished. So we need to elevate our programs to protect our people, to elevate their um, intellect, to continue to protect the working class and protect the future of our country because the country is still counting on us to carry the load. So we must be strong. We need to continue to elevate ourselves to positions of authority and making sure that we're in the part of making decisions. Because if we're not, we're, we're completely losing uh, the battle. We need to be in positions of authority and we know that we're able of doing that. Great. Thank you so much for participating in the panel. It's awesome. And I, I, will, I will definitely follow up with you. I look forward to meeting you in person. Thanks so much uh, to all of our panelists for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed hearing from our wonderful panel. A reminder that immediately at the conclusion of the webinar, a link will be pop up on your screen to take you to a survey asking for your feedback on this virtual session. Please fill it out and let us know how we can improve. Thanks once again to you for joining and a special thanks to CHCI MLB and the Smithsonian Latino Center for putting together this valuable briefing. Be sure to check out the CHCI website, which is chci.org, for updates about upcoming events and check out the new CHCI podcast, Here to Lead.